When you visit a national battlefield, national military park, or even national historical park devoted to the War of the Rebellion today, your attention is most likely on the details presented in the Visitor Center, the production quality of the video shown in the Visitor Center, or the landscape and wayside markers within the park. However, behind the scenes, there's much more that goes into these sites. And one of the aspects the previous video on Vicksburg raised is the boundaries of the parks. Few visitors ever see these, but the astute guest might notice that parts of the battlefield are not included in the park. This video will look at the boundaries of the War of Rebellion sites owned and operated by the National Park Service to illustrate the ever-changing nature of park boundaries and how much we have learned over the decades and how essential it has become to give parks extensive boundaries to protect the historic landscape within. One of the newest units in the National Park Service system is Cedar Creek and Bell Grove National Historical Park. This is a partnership park, and thus a relatively new development within the system. Instead of the National Park Service owning all the land, partners such as Bell Grove Plantation and the Shenandoah Valley Battlefield Foundation own the majority of the land included and currently publicly accessible in the park. However, the park is a patchwork of these preserved plots of land and a vast array of private land between them. This park is somewhat unique, but illustrates well the boundary topic of today's video. The park commemorates the final stage of the War of the Rebellion in the Shenandoah Valley. The battle fought on October 19, 1864, between the U.S. forces of Phil Sheridan and the rebel forces of Jubal Early was the final engagement of the Valley Campaign of 1864. Early had successfully surprised the U.S. forces camped along Cedar Creek and Shenandoah River and forced the enemy to retreat beyond the town of Middleton. When he heard of the battle, Sheridan rode down from Winchester, rallied his man for a counterattack, and with the fading daylight, forced the rebel forces off the battlefield. The battle was a great example of how quickly success and failure can change during engagements in the War of the Rebellion. Recognizing the importance of the battle, but also aware of the dubious reputation of the organization in the Shenandoah Valley, it was not until 2002 that Congress authorized the creation of the Cedar Creek and Bell Grove National Historical Park, the first nationally protected site of historical value in the Shenandoah Valley a long overdue development. The authorizing legislation granted the park a boundary that included 3,700 acres of land, while less than half of the land was in the boundaries owned by the National Park Service and its partners. The great benefit is that with such an extensive boundary, the park and its partners can purchase land for sale within the boundaries without having to go to Congress and requesting a boundary adjustment. In many ways, 
Preservationists have learned their lessons from the origins of the National Military Park movement, the urban encroachment on national battlefields, and how slow Congress sometimes acts when it comes to signs of historic importance. When in the 1890s, the country decided to reserve battlefields of the War of the Rebellion, Congress and the War Department did extensive investigations regarding the position of troops during the battle and how much land would be required to properly tell the story of the battle. In some cases, states and units placed monuments. Even more, these sites were classified as forts since there was no legal precedent or organization that could manage public land set aside for future generations. The purchase of all the land that constituted a battlefield could be rather expensive for a cash-strapped government. As a result, the principal armies, the Army of the Potomac, the Army of the Cumberland, and the Army of the Tennessee, had a full battlefield preserved. However, most of the other early battlefields were not preserved or only preserved in small parts. I will look at the Antietam preservation effort in another video and its justifications. The government only purchased small parts of land to allow visitors to reach the points of interest. In Antietam, the government purchased a few lanes and called it a day. Thankfully, in contrast to other parts of the region, urban sprawl has still not reached Sharpsburg area, and the land remains rural and agricultural in nature. While the park made small acquisitions, when land became available, such as the purchase of Dunker Church, the big push to expand the park dramatically in size came during the Mission 66 program, when the park, after much study, received permission from Congress to expand by 1,800 acres of land with a specified new boundary. The expansion, signed into law by President Dwight D. Eisenhower on April 22, 1960, allowed, however, for only 600 acres of land purchased directly. The rest would have to be obtained through easements. Ten years later, there was another request for an enlargement of the park. The expansion of the park boundaries at Antietam is an ongoing struggle. Antietam sets the agenda for other preservation projects. When Congress created the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County Battlefields Memorial National Park on February 14, 1927, the War Department only purchased the battle lines of the two opposing sides. The assumption was, just like with Antietam, that the region would not develop. Instead, the Fredericksburg area has turned into a bedroom community for people working in Washington, D.C. The result was subdivisions springing up within the wilderness, within close proximity of the battlefield. In some cases, the subdivision road is running parallel to the park road alongside the battle line. Park rangers joke sometimes that visitors see more of the region and the battlefield than the people who live there as they leave in the dark and return in the dark from their work in DC. When first created, the wilderness portion of the battlefield park was only the lines of the US Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia with a small bit of extra land purchased along the Orange Plank Road. By the 1980s, the park had obtained extra land, especially in the northern parts of the wilderness battlefield. However, the damage was done. Purchases of large areas of land to add to the park became increasingly difficult, and each new land acquisition required approval from Congress for an adjustment of the park boundary. The same held true in Fredericksburg, where the National Park Service only owns a small section of the area on Murray's Heights, from where rebel forces repulsed wave after wave of U.S. troops. 
the area over which these U.S. soldiers advanced is sadly buried under urban development, and a small visual barrier of trees keeps visitors from seeing that urban development. The southern battlefield is preserved more fully, but as the 12 million 2003 purchase of the Slaughter Pan Farm by the Civil War Preservation Trust, Modern Day American Battlefield Trust, illustrates, there remain some holes. Interestingly, property records indicate that the Slaughter Pan Farm is still owned by the American Battlefield Trust. It has not been donated to the National Park Service, likely because there hasn't been a boundary adjustment successfully brought before and through Congress. Petersburg is another excellent example of the shifting attitudes and boundaries of national battlefield parks. The core of the park preserves the early battlefield and siege areas, including the famous crater. In addition, the park in Antietam plan fashion includes parts of the U.S. fortification line and some of the rebel lines as well, at least those that had not been submerged under Petersburg's urban development. In 1967, the National Park Service suggested handing back to the state the small section of park where the U.S. line had been located between Fort Davis and Fort Wheaton, as well as rebel installations from Battery Pegram to Fort Lee. This represented a dramatic reduction in size and scope of the battlefield. The park retained a small section of the land planned for disestablishment and retained the area from Fort Wheaton and Fort Fisher. Even today, the park tour still travels along the road that connected Fort Davis and Fort Wadsworth, but it's a public road, not owned by the National Park Service. Ironically, in 2016, there was talk about enlarging the Petersburg National Battlefield. Almost all of the new land considered, however, was beyond the city limits of Petersburg and would have highlighted the later stages of the siege, such as the Battle of Five Forks, with an enhanced and enlarged protected area. Unsurprisingly, the bills were introduced but never acted on in Congress. This was not the first time the topic of enlarging the boundaries of Petersburg National Battlefield came before Congress, which had faced the issue since 2011. The boundaries of parks owned by the National Park Service, devoted to the War of the Rebellion, have been contentious and ever-shifting. Because these are public sites, it is up to Congress to create them to enlarge them, but also to decrease their size. Oftentimes, parks are able to grow, but because of the slow pace of Congress's operations, boundaries adjust not very often. And in some cases, when a boundary is finally adjusted, it is too late, as urban encroachment has already destroyed that battle. In many ways, we're lucky to have a park like Cedar Creek and Bell Grove National Historical Park where Congress granted an extensive boundary within which the National Park Service and its partners can purchase land at their leisure. Instead of situations like Petersburg, the Wilderness, or Fredericksburg, where the Park Service is hard-pressed to expand in any way. Thank you for watching this episode of the War of the Rebellion channel. If you liked the material covered, please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell for new episodes. If there's a story of the War of the Rebellion you would like covered, please leave a comment. Use the comments to engage in conversations. Thank you for patronizing the War of the Rebellion channel.